Bueno, eh, es uno un gusto hoy. Eh, buenos días. Good morning. I will make the presentation in in English because that was uh, the language that we were uh, going to use in the table. But let me say some uh, grateful words in in Spanish. Uh, lo, en primer lugar, gracias a todos los que y todas las que habéis asistido a este evento que organizamos con dos objetivos bastante marcados. Por un lado, intentar entender en qué consistía el, lo que viene a ser el, el incremento de la diversidad etnorreligiosa en el contexto europeo y, por otro, intentar ver qué incidencia tiene esto en la vida política tanto de las naciones europeas como también en el propio marco de la Unión Europea. Y no me extiendo más porque lo importante y lo interesante serán las palabras de los ponentes, pero permitidme agradecer eh, muy sinceramente en nombre de Globernance al Departamento de Empleo y Políticas Sociales del Gobierno Vasco, a la Diputación Foral de Ipuzcoa, a Santelmo Museo A, a EH Ugune y a Eurobasque, en la figura de José Ramón Bengoechea, por el apoyo que nos han ofrecido para poder organizar este evento. Besteri gabe, itza Linda Budek dauka ekitaldiari asiera emateko. Linda, pues. My name is Linda Wood and I'm the presenter for the first panel discussion. We'd like to welcome today Dr. Alexander Gorlock. He will discuss in the first panel the influence of religious narratives on populist ideology. Following his presentation, Dr. Sergio Garcia will provide his perspective on this topic as a sociologist and a representative of the Baha'i community. After Dr. Garcia's remarks, then we will open up the discussion for questions and comments. So first, by way of introduction, uh, Dr. Gorlock holds PhDs in religion and in linguistics. He is well known as the founder and former editor-in-chief of a debate magazine, The European. Dr. Gorak is an expert on religious identities that influence, and their influence on global politi politics. Having recently completed his post at Harvard University, he will now spend his summer here in Donostia as a visiting scholar at the University of the Basque Country. Next academic year, he will be a visiting professor at universities in Hong Kong and in Taiwan. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Alexander Gorok. So thank you for, for the kind introduction and uh, thank you. Is that working? No. Can you switch? Oh, ah, no. Okay, I thought it would be. So thank you for the kind introduction and uh, thank you, uh, Jorge and uh, Daniel for hosting me over the summer here in uh, San Sebastian. It's a pleasure uh, to be here. Well, the subject matter has, um, has been around for, for a while, but I'd say in um, the emphasis on religion in politics or religious narratives in, in politics have become, uh, again, very obvious in the verge of the refugee crisis uh, that broke in 2015. And uh, you may be well aware of it that uh, in, in this time, Germany and uh, Sweden and Austria and other countries took in um, a vast amount of refugees from Syria uh, and uh, also like from Iraq and Afghanistan, but mainly from Syria. And this re-sparked the debate about um, whether or not people from another cultural background, uh, speaking as in Muslim background, uh, may have the capacity to settle within a non-Muslim, as in a Christian framework. Um, so this, this debate has been all over the place in, in Europe, and as you also, I'm sure, very well aware of it, has had protagonists in, in the Netherlands with uh, Gerd Wilders, uh, protagonists in France with uh, Madame Le Pen, and also in the verge of the Brexit referendum, uh, protagonists such as Boris Johnson and most of all uh, Nigel Farage from UKIP party in, in England. When you look into the, um, the arguments portrayed, um, very often the remark is made that the cultural background of um, Muslims uh, is just different. So um, by saying that, it means like the, um, uh, it's been emphasized on the role of women or on, on how Muslim societies may treat homosexuals. 
Um, I would rather argue that this is, um, well, just the forefront of, 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 of arguments. The real core of what these people from the right wing mostly want to say is that Muslims for coming from, to Europe may lack the loyalty to the uh, established order, so we speak. And why is that? When you look into, or uh, first of all, what do we mean by, by narratives? And narratives are not particularly, um, nothing particular to the right or the left or to any political group. It's by which societies run. So every society has narratives, tidings, news, um, uh, storylines that keep them together. And um, following an argument by an Israeli historian, Yural Harari, who wrote this uh, sweet book, uh, A Brief History of Mankind, and be advised, if somebody says something as brief or short in the title, it's a lie. So the book is like this, and it's called A Short, a short Introduction. So that is gonna be, yeah, you know, but be, be, be advised, that's uh, ten so that's, uh, that's mostly a delusion. Uh, so however, but he comes up and says like, whenever you have um, to make people collaborate in a framework that is bigger than your family, you need sort of narratives that keeps the people going and working together. You need a, a common spirit, uh, so to speak. And um, um, Mr. Harari comes up with two uh, sort of narratives um, that he, he claims as an historian and as a cultural anthropologist uh, that bound together every society he is aware of. And that's gossip and uh, religious or mythological narratives. So gossip, like Prangelina, so Brad Pitt and, and, and Angelina Jolie getting married, getting divorced, having so many children, uh, adopted this, that, and um, basically this, this story you can tell from Mexico to India, so everybody is aware of that. So uh, believe it or not, but this gossip sort of uh, uh, um, tidings, uh, they form a narrative. They form narratives within societies and they uh, create um, a topic that people can talk about. Like our friends in England that love to talk about the weather because the weather is also is always something that is like non-political, so you find a framework by which you have something to refer to. The other, Harari would say, is mythological or religious uh, narratives. And that's quite interesting because once you are like in a group and you collaborate, uh, you may ask yourself very quickly, what for? So what is the purpose of this endeavor? And uh, he would argue that our, 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 the, the big mythological uh, tidings that are in the beginning very much restrained to actually these groups. There was nothing, the, 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 the tiny group that tried to collaborate together, that did, um, let's say, go for hunt together or whatever they did in back in the Stone Age. But this is the time where it started uh, that these mythological narratives were, uh, were deployed. And, um, and these narratives make the group connect to the future it may have and the past it already had. So it is a very much defining the identity, the core identity of a group and also the pace or the uh, direction it is heading towards. So, um, and this in short, uh, coming to, to our days, you realize that these uh, narratives when they are um, about the coming and the going of a, of a specific group, it of course creates a feeling of belonging that works only by also defining the non-belonging. So who is part of the group and who is not part of the group. So now fast forward to mo modern times. Um, uh, what Harari portrayed as religious or mythological um, um, narratives, they have an equivalent, of course, in politics. Every developed religion we know has um, had ideas about the whereabouts of our earthly endeavors. So the state, the polity, the res publica, the polis. So there are ideas um, religious ideas which are secular in the first place because they help to understand or to legitimize the order in which we live. So when the refugees came to Europe, 
believe it or not, when people in general, before it was like exploited by the right wing, so just the general uh, framework within the debate is, is conducted about do Muslims belong to Europe or not, is a, a, a framework of leg legitimacy that roots back into the, the Greek, even the Greek polis and the, the Roman state. And if we just have a, a tiny look into European history, we may realize that the, after the decline of the Roman Empire, the last institution standing from that period of time was um, the church. And when the German kings decided to pick up the emperorship, they went to the, to the Pope in Rome and Charlemagne went to, to Rome and the Pope uh, blessed the reign of the new uh, emperor under the condition that the new emperor is uh, the protector of the church. And um, by this, you established a, a, a secular narrative, secular in, not in the sense that God is absent in the public sphere, but the religious claims of Christianity made the pol political system run. And also, political religion has a life in itself. It is not dependent on the Christian institutions like the Catholic or the Lutheran Church. It's also not bound by the, by the, by the teaching, a dogmatic teaching of the church. It is a, a, a system and a body in itself that, also, that, that fuels until this very day um, everyday conceptions of many Europeans when it comes to leg legitimacy and rulership. It is to provide a place or a belonging, as I said earlier, in, in the framework we live in. So when you look into what happened two years ago uh, and the refugees came to Europe and the right-wing parties all over the place exploited that for their narratives, you could find many church officials opposing uh, the claims that Muslims wouldn't belong to Europe. Uh, basically, the Pope himself uh, was urging every parish and every monastery in Europe to take in one Syrian refugee family. However, uh, a nation such as Poland, who claimed for themselves to be very Catholic, uh, did deny the request of the pontiff and, uh, and did not take in uh, Syrian refugees of Muslim belief. Also, uh, Hungary didn't do this, also claiming uh, for itself uh, the Christian heritage of its nation. And also Slovenia co commented just briefly and saying, we don't have any mosques here, we are not intending to build any, so we don't take any uh, Muslims in. So clearly you have an, uh, very much an evidence that there is a different narrative going on in the religious circles about the Christian nature of, of uh, a public the res publica, the polity, and within the political framework. So when it comes to the debate about whether or not Islam is a part of Europe, uh, or as we had it in, in Germany, our former president Christian Wolf once made a statement in a speech, uh, Islam belongs to Germany. Uh, he was widely criticized for that. Uh, and um, I think it is because these narratives, these political narratives, the quasi-religious or religious political narratives, if you will, they very much rest upon a belief in loyalty, and also these narratives are mutually exclusive. So the political religious framework that we have in the Occident is of course different from the one they have in Egypt or in Turkey, because Islam as a religion and Christianity as a religion have deployed and developed different forms of engaging with the polity. So in the Christian, in the Christian context, it was nothing less than the fall of Rome in the year four, 410 that made St. Augustine and other uh, ecclesiastic writers uh, rethink the I ideas or the, the, yeah, the general approach that Christianity would have towards um, the polity before, before Christianity became uh, the law of the land in the Roman Empire. Christians were just pacifists, and that's been it. But once you have, um, once you are the, the leading or the prevalent or even the dominant religion in an empire, you can't just refrain from dealing with um, 
earthly, secular matters. Same holds true for Islam, which became in the very beginning, in the very first years of its, of its existence, already a political endeavor. And already in the lifetime of Muhammad, is, Islam expanded and um, was then confronted as well with uh, the questions of earthly rulership. So it has never been like just a, only a spiritual endeavor. Christianity, on the other hand, was for the first centuries uh, more or less a, a, a bound and confined to spiritual um, uh, matters. However, Christians have been perceived as a threat to the existence of the Roman Empire. So Christianity also in its first centuries had to make up its mind uh, how it will be dealing with uh, secular earthly uh, matters with the polity. So these narratives are mutual exclusive. And by the way, by all means, not only restricted to a Western uh, framework. If you look into today's India, you will find a, a majority leading party, the government leading party of Hindu nationals, who, nationalists who would claim that the, the essence of India, which we in the West praise as the, the, the largest democracy on earth, they would claim India is in fact a Hindu nation, and they make hunt on the on the um, the Muslim minority in the country. So it's not only that Christianity or monotheistic religions per se would have a tendency to be um, exclusive. You find it in other contexts as well, and um, this is actually why this topic of this conference is, um, even though we may have a focus on Europe, uh, because we live in Europe and that makes it easier to comprehend, it is a, a, um, a topic that adheres to all corners of the world in which we live today. And I um, may conclude this speech with a, um, a few remarks about why I think that is. So when we look into the, the rise of, of the right wings uh, parties, be it the alternative for Germany in, in, in Germany or uh, UKIP in England or the, uh, I mean, you, you name it, uh, Cinque Stelle in Italy, for instance, you find always two or one main argument saying that globalization and digitalization have been uh, accelerating uh, our human societies so much have uh, erased borders in many ways, from EasyChat to internet, from Netflix to Facebook, you can name it, and all of you use these electronic means. That is, I mean, the surveys in Europe show 80% of Europeans, 85% of Europeans, at all age groups, they use email, and they also gain uh, news in, through the internet. So there may be pockets where people uh, resist this, uh, this developments, uh, but as a matter of fact, uh, it's, it has accelerated uh, all our lives. And uh, when I remember like, let's say 20 years ago, well, let's say when I was a child and we would have gotten to the best country as tourists, my family and I, so my dad and my mom, they would have gotten furious about which way to go now. And they would read a map and my dad would say to my mom, you can't read the map, give me the map and all that. And today they just have this tiny thing in there which tells there's a nice voice and they tell them where to go. So um, we are all very complacent with the, all very comfortable uh, with the, um, developments. However, there are backlashes, and these backlashes refer mostly to the identities we adhere to and the loyalties we pledge. In the globalized world, uh, yes, sure, you are Basque and I'm German, or there is also something like Spain and there's England, and we pledge like our allegiance to the region we live in for lots of historic reasons, for reasons of language and culture. But we also realize that um, we only alone do not suffice in this globalized world. So Germany having the biggest economy in Europe, the chancellor always refers to saying, we cannot do it alone. We need the European allies and also we need international collaboration, let's say when we tackle climate change. So climate change and indeed is one of the first things uh, where religions in a large scale have tried to work together because they all to a certain extent believe in something that the Christian framework would call a creation. So for the very first time when in the late 60s, this famous photo was shot that everybody of you knows, 
uh, um, it's called Earthrise, and it was shot by the by the by the uh, astronauts in the Apollo uh, um, on the Apollo mission, and it shows like it's the first photo from out of space from the planet Earth, and uh, and it is widely seen as the spark of peace movements, of uh, environmental movements, and of course many religious gr groups have have joined this. However, this is the first time, and this is the first time in history where we not only theoretically can think about a collaboration, but also have the technological means, and also we have the urge to do something in many, reg in many regards when it comes to, to climate change. And if you look into, into global, uh, global trade, it's not just only um, goods that go back and forth. It's like in the good old days with the Silk Road, it's people and it's ideas. Christianity spread through the, the, the commercial roads, so did Islam. And so we have today a, an interchange of ideas, ideologies, Weltanschauung, that has not been seen in any, in any, in any uh, um, era of human history so far. So, I, I think this is in fact a legitimate claim to say that these developments that have accelerated in the last 25 years may have also led to a, a backlash when it comes to uh, identities and the inclusiveness of identities. Um, so um, the, uh, there has been a book of almost 50 years ago and, uh, and um, the, the title says it all. It's um, uh, The Future Shock. So the shock about future, uh, Toffler is the, is the guy who wrote it. And it's, it's interesting, it's 50 years ago, but what he's claiming is, he said there may be a, a moment in history where inventions, where innovations may have such a speed, such a pace that norm, normal, that, that humans cannot perceive and not comprehend uh, all these developments at, uh, in, in the given time, in the necessary time. And um, if you look into what happened in the last 15 years, 20 years, I just mentioned a few things, but if you go into, into medicine or research about the human genome and all, I mean, we can name it, you can easily believe the thesis of that book that we may be in a, in a moment of history where, where many people, it's not about only common people, it's also academics, it's in all walks of life, uh, have to pause and to rethink their identity and, uh, and, and to rephrase it even uh, in, the, in the conspect of, of a globalized world. So in the, in, the, in, the, in the German context, and you can see it in many European countries as well, we have had a very close chop narrative. So the Swedes are Protestants, the English are Anglican, and the Italians are Catholic, so are the Spaniards, and many of our European identities have been very much confined over the century through a homogeneity that has also been enforced by uh, governments and by political ideologies. So other than the United States, for instance, who have had like a narrative for a long time of inclusiveness, the Europeans have learned this sort of inclusiveness in the last 70 years. And now uh, being on the center stage of, of, of world politics as a so-called soft power, Europe can only uh, gain capital by fostering and even implementing more ideas of inclusiveness. However, being now the, the Union of 27 have just lost uh, England, it's also within the European framework that people rethink their identities and their um, narratives. And to conclude, I think what we have seen in the past is that all our narratives ran on a us versus them rhetoric. So it's always been like my group against the other. The uh, beginning of social behavior theory uh, in, in the 70s, um, oh my God, do I remember the name? The name will come to me right, right away. It's like, it's like the, um, it's the basis of Toffler. No, not Toffler, what's the name? Oh, I mean, I will come back to the name. Um, but basically what they did, they uh, made, um, children play and they said to the children here's your team and you play against another team the children have not seen either their teammates or the other 
uh, players. They were just been told they, they play this game like on a board game uh, and they play against another team. And they would, even though they have not seen their teammates or the opponents, they would always go automatically, inherently, with the alleged people of their team. And this is where, where it comes to, I'd say, to the proof that if religion wouldn't do the job of us versus them, another entity would do. As we see today, in our today's European world, where religion is saying, no, no, that's not how we do it. We are inclusive and we try to help the refugees. You find right-wing politicians saying, no, no, it's us versus them. So it has a deeply enrooted, um, um, entrenched part of our identity that we like and try to separate the world um, in us versus them. And another uh, second aspect, which has been elaborated on by French philosopher René Girard quite a lot, it's about once we have done this and sorted out, this is the majority group, this is our opponent, it very quickly uh, comes to start that uh, we scapegoat the other group, that we realize, the majority realizes these are our problems, um, but someone must be uh, responsible for that. So Europe is, has, been, has a long-standing history in claiming this on the Jews. So the Jews are responsible for everything, for bad weather and, and bad harvest and all that shit. And it's been, we have done this for like centuries. So um, there is um, unfortunately a long-standing history in, under, in understanding for Europeans what scapegoating is. If you look into today's Russia where the economy is down, but Mr. Putin is like uh, uh, um, emphasizing on orthodoxy as a bulwark against Western liberalism. And by the way, all the homosexuals are, are guilty. So that's something where, where you have another scapegoat because you'd sit in the West and you think, how are homosexuals responsible for your bad economy? And we know it's not, and Gerard, and Gerard would say that from outside the system, you would always know this scapegoating is just like a, it's a joke. Also like in Turkey, Mr. Erdogan, he seems to, like every journalist is a threat, every if you, if you happen to distribute a, a Bible in, in Istanbul, you are considered a threat to national security because in a country of 99% Sunni Muslims, of course, two or three people reading the Bible pose a national threat. This is, of course, ridiculous. But it's, again, it's, it's, a, it's a means of securing your power and, uh, and, um, and to... The, the biggest danger, like in, in the German context, <coughs> I think it was <coughs> Goebbels or... Goebbels or Himmler, who said, like, every, <clears throat> every German has himself a good Jew. Like saying, people would come unto him saying, yeah, maybe the Jews are responsible, but the one in my neighborhood, he's just such a nice guy. You can't really deport him. He's really, they are great. So the worst thing that can happen in such a framework is that people really meet, like, nice Muslims, nice homosexuals, whatever, because then this, um, the, the, the scapegoating or the demonizing doesn't work. So, in Germany, guess, the regions with the least foreign population are the most xenophobe. Like where Pegida, this, um, this uh, marching group against the Islamization of the West, as they say, uh, they marched out from Dresden. Dresden has l less than 2% uh, foreigners, and I'm not even sure how many are Muslims um, amongst those 2%. So to demonize another group, to secure your, your claims to legitimacy, the best thing is this group is totally absent, because the moment this group shows up, it's just like people realize, oh, they are not so bad after all. So so um, I would argue that um, when we cannot live without narratives and not without narratives that are um, consistent of gossip and mythology, we would have to work on narratives of inclusiveness in the future that live without an us versus them rhetoric. Because as we can see from the past, these divisive narratives have always brought trouble. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Gorick, and I'm glad that you ended on a little bit of a high note there. I was beginning to get depressed about the state of affairs, so I'd like to hold that thought as we turn our attention to our next speaker, Dr. Sergio Garcia, and he will offer his perspective on um, ethno-religious pluralism 
Dr. Garcia is a sociologist who's written and spoken extensively on religious conflict, fundamentalism, and the process of radicalization. Dr. Garcia is also a representative of the Baha'i faith community in Spain. Please welcome Dr. Sergio Garcia. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I would like to thank to uh, Governance for organizing this event, especially to Ander and, and to Mikel, who is, I, I, don't see, I don't see his face, but I want to thank him for the effort they, they put in this space. Uh, <clears throat> I will try to, to put forward during my presentation three hypotheses related to this issue. Uh, and these three hypotheses are not causal factors for the rise of uh, populist movements in Europe, but I think that they constitute the framework within which the debate about issues related to, to religion take place. And actually, I think that these three factors uh, make it, makes it difficult to understand these phenomena like terrorism, fundamentalism, radicalization. And these, these three points are, are a defective understanding of the theory of secularization, a defective understanding of religion and the nature of religion and its social uh, mission. And, and finally, the fact that the tr liberal tradition has become like a, a tradition which uh, presents itself as a non-values tradition. It's the framework, but uh, it sets the logic, the language, the assumption that people who enter the debate about this issue, they, they have to assume the logics of the liberal tradition. And in order to do so, I will focus on four points. The first one will be a revision of the secularization theory and, and the ideology of secularism. The, the second one, I will try to question the liberal framework I mentioned that sets the language, the tone, and the logics of the debate about issues related to religion. The third one is the way I consider that religion should be approached to understand these issues. And finally, I will try to identify some factors related to religion uh, that feed populist movements. And, and during my presentation, I will try to connect with uh, what Dr. Alexander mentioned, about, especially about identity. So uh, to begin with the first point, the secularization and secularism, you, uh, you, you probably know that, that secularis, uh, uh, secularization is part of a broader theory about modernization and how uh, traditional communities uh, pass through different stages through, through, uh, uh, and towards the modern world. Uh, so as societies move from traditional to modern entities, the different social processes occur rationalization, the separation of, of social systems into different spheres with their own logics like culture, religion, politics, and so on. The migration from rural areas to cities, the bureaucratization of the governmental processes, and secularization, and one of these processes within the, the wider frame, framework of modernization. And this process took place in the Western world, but it was taken as a universal process. Somehow there, there were normative and predictive assumptions that that had to happen throughout the world. And then other theories came up, like the multiple modernities and, and things like that, but they take the same assumption for granted, that that process that took place in the Western world sh should happen throughout the world. And then when you, when you look at the empirical data, you see that secularization had to be with different aspects, but not with all the aspects that were mentioned in the wider interpretation of the secularization. It seems that there was a loss of loyalty towards traditional religious institutions, that there is empirical evidence of that. There is empirical evidence that there, there was a reallocation of religion from the totality of the social system to an autonomous sphere, like politics, science, culture. And in some cases, also, there was this separation of certain traditional religious practices, like Christmas or the Eastern uh, holidays, from the religious meanings. There is empirical evidence of these issues, but then there is a, a more wide or broad interpretation about secularization, which poses that as societies become more modern, religion will disappear or simply religion will become a private issue, or maybe a folklore or different and exotic practices, or maybe other phenomena like sports. There are people saying that well, religion doesn't disappear, but it transforms and it becomes like a sports, and people are passionate about that. So in any case, it seems that public policies took these wider conclusions with no much empirical evidence as facts, and they behave in consequence. So they, they overlooked the role of religion in society and, and 
uh, one like I, I would say that uh, a worst point is that that they overlooked the sociological complex transformations that were taking place in the religiosity of people. What was happening with social reality in terms of, of the re religiosity. And in addition, there were some people who took these ideas as an ideology and they tried to promote it. They, they, they didn't take that as a theory, this is happening, no, this should happen and we will promote it somehow. So, on the contrary, it seems that some of the sociological transformations that were advancing in other ways, and, and there are certain issues that when you look at religion and the religiosity of people more carefully are happening. I, I, I will try to, uh, to make some points related to the other researches about, about this. So it seems that the first one is that many of the conflicts that are happening today and, and some revolutions uh, throughout the world, they have an, a religious inspiration. For instance, the, the Iranian revolution. No? It's, it's, it's considered a modern, a modern phenomenon, but religion played an important role there. Hindu nationalism, you were mentioning, there is a mixture between religion uh, uh, and, and nationalism there. The Buddhist nationalism in Sri Lanka, which is very much connected to, to religion, religious non-violent civil disobedience movements, the rise of evangelical politics in the United States, the so-called Islamic terrorist movement, so all these issues are connected to religion. And then a second movement in this line is that when you look at the sociological service about the religiosity of people widely throughout the world, uh, it seems that the religiosity of people worldwide is not uh, it's not decreasing, it's even increasing. I will take some data, for instance, there is the, the World Value Survey, which, which is carried out about uh, 56 countries from 1980s to uh, 2000. And it found that the levels of religiosity of, of people increased from 80% to 83% when you take the world's population. And then the only region in the world where the levels of, re of religiosity decreased was the Western Europe, and it went from 81% to 78. So there was a, a, a slight uh, uh, decrease. And then when you look at the Eastern Europe, it increased from 86% to 78%. And then when you look at China, uh, there, was, there is a very interesting movement there, uh, like people who cited religion as a major influence in, in their life grew from 22% to 36%. Then you, you have to look at this data carefully, and then what's the conceptualization they make, the question they ask, so it's not a, a definite conclusion, but there are certain data which are showing that the movement goes in another direction, or that this is more complex than what it was mentioned. Then uh, another idea related to religion and, and society, there are certain sorry, are the mind undermining the idea that modernity and religion are somehow at odds. And they are showing that religion has played an important role in encouraging many non-Western people to accept, for instance, modern science, modern medicine, democratic politics. I have here the authors, if then someone wants to look at them. For, there is also Daniele Conversi. There is this research of Iker Basque. Uh, Daniel knows him. He also is, is making some research in this, in this area. And then uh, also the, the theory of secularization has been challenged by many authors like uh, uh, Johannes Struck, Casanova, there are many people who are interpreting the, the secularization theory more uh, sophistically. Uh, then also in the, in the field of social and economic development, over the last two decades is recognizing religion as, as a force for the economic development when it promotes certain attitudes, not any kind of religion, not any kind of religious attitudes, but they are looking at, at how a certain religious attitude could, could promote a religious, uh, sorry, economic growth. For instance, this attitude towards work, when there is this idea that you have to work hard, you have to save money, these are certain attitudes that promote a development process. Of course, there are other attitudes that certain religions also promote that they could be a, an obstacle for economic growth. But there is a growing interest of the, on the role of religion in the development processes and also in the role of religious-based organizations in, in development uh, processes. And then also, uh, when you look at, at Europe, there, are, there is a, a, a multiplication of different, of different religions in Europe. And some people are mentioning that there is a, like a growing search for meaning in, in Europe, and 
some people are looking at, at different forms of religion and spirituality. There are new movements. Then also there are religions who want to enter the public debate uh, to talk about different issues. There, there are issues of identity related to religion. So th that's the first point, that there is a, a, like a two basic understanding of secularization process, and that prevents a good understanding of what's happening with, the, with social reality. Then the, the second point has to be with the liberal tradition, and I would say that it has become the framework, and it, it's unquestioned that the logics it Im imposes of people have to be the logics of the debate, and that makes it very b difficult to understand issues related to the, the, the Islamic politics and the Muslim world, because the liberal framework uh, takes for granted certain assumptions, and, and they are taken as facts. There is a book, McIntyre, in, in a book called Competing Rationalities, uh, mentions a few ideas about how the liberal tradition has become the prominent tradition and it's overlooking a certain assumption. So one of them is that the liberal partisan democracy is the best system of government or democracy, the, the, on, the, the only one. Then that the idea that the individual is the main entity of social life and political and civil individual rights is the key for progress. Then the separation between the public sphere and the private sphere, the relevance of the individual over the community and the individual identity over the collective identity. These are liberal assumptions. Then that there is a tension between institution and citizens. It's taking for granted that a, a healthy society needs to have institution and then a strong civil society which somehow controls the government and, and so on. Then, also the notion of, po of power as domination. There is this prevalent conception of power as domination, which can offer for, from that tradition. Economy as the axis for social life, competition as the, as the articulating principle for social organization and, and the key for excellence. The split between religion and politics, religion, the public sphere, mind and heart, faith and reason. Then instrumental rationality as the highest form of rationality, economic growth as the key for, for uh, uh, progress, uh, nature as a resource to be exploded, national interest as the axis for international. Re so there are many assumptions which are taken uh, for granted and it makes it very difficult uh, to, to, to understand the case of, of Islamic. No, because the, somehow the, the liberal interpretation of, of what should be done with Islam in Europe has to do with that the Islamic world has to experience a modernization process and that implies that Islam has to renounce to the political dimension it has. My point is that that's impossible because Islam, the conception of Islam is that politics and religion are interconnected and actually there are other, other groups, other conceptions that they pose the same idea. So there is a very specific phenomenon in the Western world which has uh, divided religion and politics, but there other parts of the world they have other other interpretations. So, two last points very shortly, and I and I finish. So the the third point is the way I think that that uh, social phenomena linked to religion should be approached, like fundamentalism, radicalization on Islamic terrorists. So the f the first point is that I think that that phenomena related to religion should be approached under the logic of religion. When you take, for instance, Islamic movements and you try to understand them just from the logic of collective identity, from the logic of, of politics, from, from the logic of uh, social service, I don't know, you lack some, you, you missed an important understanding of that phenomenon because there is a religious base. So a, a good understanding of what is religion, what is its nature, what is the social role that historically has played, I think it's, that's, that's a key. Actually, connecting with Dr. Alexander mentioned, when you, under, when you analyze the different frameworks of the re, different religions, you see that there is a potentiality to overcome these conflicting notions of identity because there is this common idea that at the heart of human beings there is a soul. So somehow there is a collective identity there. 
And, and then the other identities are secondary. It, it could be gender, it could be religion, it could be uh, na nation, it could be social class, any kind of, of these identities are secondary. So there is this potentiality within the framework or the different religions to overcome these conflicting notions of, of identity. And then once you understand this phenomenon and the, the logics of, of religion, then you also can uh, try to understand them from other logics like politics, identity, legitimizing discourses, narratives, any other, any other logic. And, and, and then to end up, I will mention like some of the, of the specific uh, causes that I, I, I think that has to do with, with the rise of, of populist movements, which are somehow the first one is that religion, migration has generated prejudice as well. And, and, and that also fuels these, these movements. Then global integration has generated different frameworks of reference and feelings of disorientation among society and, and citizens. And, and somehow that's channeled by the populist movement because they have a, a lot of clarity about which is our identity, who we are, what we should do, who we are not, and so on. Then there is this, this double problem of Islam. Why? Because on the one hand, it's a, it's a religion. On the other hand, it's associated with immigration. So there are prejudices related to this. And at the same time, there is the logic of religion that I mentioned that somehow is, is, is missing from the, from the understanding of the, of the phenomenon. Then, then, of course, the fact that Al-Qaeda and the Islamic states have emerged in, in the world, also that uh, has fuels this movement because this use they use this this phenomenon also to to justify the, their their positions without Al Qaeda and the Islamic states you couldn't pose some of the ideas that the populist movements are, are proposing and then fear Islamophobia this this issue also fuels this this movement the economic crisis as well but one interesting data and empirical data is that um, it seems that those people who have more connected to prejudice and Islamophobia are not who are in the, in the worst economic situation. It's middle class, something like that. So they are in somehow a good position, but, but they don't want to lose that position. So that's, that's. And then also there is this search for certitudes in, in, a, in a society which is in crisis. There are different uh, worldviews and so on. So these populist movements, they have a, a very cl clear ideas about these issues. And then, as I, as I mentioned before, uh, there is a search for identities. Uh, that, uh, one of the things that is happening also in the Western world is that individualization, which has been good, but to some extent, but when you take that process of the individualization too far and you break any kind of connection with other people, there is this need for community, the, the, commu the collective identity. And the, the social networks somehow are playing this role or, or, or trying to satisfy human longing for belonging. But they are too weak, too weak. So that's why people also need this collective dimension uh, to belong to some groups. And this populist movement also, they, they take advantage of, of this need. And finally, I would say that these social transformations I mentioned before at the level of, of religiosity are not well understood from political instances. And there is a disconnection between politics and social reality. And it has a lot of practical implications. For instance, in the, in the area of radicalization, I, I have a, a research there, and you see that some of the practices, the, the, the police practices, the way the media are presenting this issue, it, it could be successful at short uh, terms. But when you look at lo long terms, they are nurturing some radicalization processes by the way they are trying to combat this, this uh, fundamentalism uh, movement. So thank you very much, and I would be happy to, to continue with the, with the conversation. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Garcia. In the time that we have remaining for this first panel discussion, we'd like to open up the discussion for questions and comments from the panelists and the roundtable and also from the audience. So do we have a first question? So thanks for this very thought-provoking and uh, insightful uh, presentations. My, my question actually will be for both of, of the presenters and will be in the sense of uh, something that Sergio has commented, that it's the, the intrinsic uh, dynamic of Islam of having uh, both religious and political 
uh, projects or fostering uh, both religious and political projects. And I was wondering, uh, in this sense, how you consider that we can accommodate the fact that, in, at least in Western Europe, the territoriality of, of democracy is it's somehow related also to identity features, but, but not necessarily identity features, with the fact that we, we have co-citizens that, due to their uh, religious logic, that, that I'm not uh, in any way judging, but, but due to this might have also some uh, pretension, territorial pretensions of pursuing a, a political project within a territory where, where we have a, a liberal democracy. I actually don't understand what you mean by the territory thing. I mean that Somehow, yes. the democracy implies that we, we have a set of citizens that are living in a territory and somehow are ruling themselves. But within that territory, there are uh, some of the citizens of, of that territory might have uh, an alternative project that not necessarily uh, is compatible with, with the minimum uh, standards fixed by, by this liberal democracy. So how, how can we manage to, to accommodate these, these tensions? I'm, I'm I think you refer to Islam as a, allegedly as a group where people may not subscribe to this set of ideas of liberal democracy. Is that what you mean? Okay, but also, okay. I mean, I don't know. The, uh, the, if you look into history like a century and a bit ago, every Catholic priest in Europe was uh, made uh, a vow that he would oppose modernism. And, uh, and uh, modernity, as we see today, as a liberal democratic framework, has been challenging also to the religion of the land, so to speak, to Christianity or to Catholicism in a, uh, to a large extent, which may help us understand why the Muslim community, and by large numbers, uh, do not fully support um, the ideals of liberal democracy, if you would make surveys, right? So, and uh, in, in the times, like when I was a kid, there was like a new legislation in Germany about abortion. And uh, the Catholic regions of Germany were very wild about this. And uh, so you, you always had to try to accommodate religious identities or ideals within the, um, the liberal framework. It's not the other way around. There's this, the, the, I mean, there's this one thing that John Rawls came up with, like the concept of an overlapping consensus. And there's also like Charles Taylor, the Canadian philosopher, trying to work with that. So, and it's always the question, what is in the forefront, the religious identity or, or the, the, um, the general framework within a society? But I guess it's always a, it's a give and take, where you have, a, you have a, a liberal democracy is made out of people who have convictions, and these convictions are informed by, by, by different sources. I ask you if you ask, talk about Islam, because the, the, this is so multifold, and uh, you have also like players from foreign countries, like the Turkish government now, trying to influence the Turkish populace in Germany and all other parts of the country. So this is not the normal state. So when we discuss, we, we, we speak about ideal, an ideal framework. So now we have like Turkey trying to interfere uh, in, into European affairs through uh, the Muslimness of the Turks that live in Europe. You also have like the influence Saudi Arabia is trying to impose with a Stone Age Islam on, uh, on Europe by funding mosques. So that's something that, of course, the liberal order has not, a liberal democracy cannot just watch while other people try to demolish it. But in the ideal framework, in the theory, in the theory of, of pluralism and, and, uh, and such, a religious idea or convictions that you may have as a secular or a religious mind have always a place in, within the framework. And it's, uh, it's a part of the negotiation art within a liberal democracy to balance these different interests and find the, the common denominator. I, I, I would say that one of the ideas that McIntyre poses has to do with your question. I think that th there is a moment in any kind of society where the framework of reference also should be an object of debate. And I, I think that there are no debates about the framework of reference, especially when there is 
a transformation at the level of, 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 of what's happening with the people. Immigration has brought other worldviews, religion brings other worldviews, so somehow there, there is this need to debate about these fundamental issues. Of course, you cannot be doing that all the time because you need to establish a framework for coexistence, but somehow it's healthy to debate about these issues without taking for granted everything. I, I think that there is more, within the, the democratic framework, there is a space to debate about these issues because the liberal interpretation are not all the same. There are more like, so there are more people who take, even communitarian debates, some people say that it's a, an extension of liberalism as well. So in the communitarian, uh, under the communitarian perspective, there, are, there is a space to speak about collective identities, coexistence. But some, I, I, I don't have a direct uh, proposal, but I think that these issues should be object of debate with, among people who have different worldviews and somehow there is a time where any kind of society, they have to, to come to intersubjective agreements again about these fundamental issues. No? And, and maybe now it's not the time because the percentage of, of people with different perspectives is not so high, but as that becomes uh, bigger, I think that debate uh, should be take, take place. Yes, 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 yes. Uh, I want to comment on something you said earlier and which also reflects in what you say now about secularism and secularization. I mean, totally right what you said. It's two different things and it's also like exhausting for the whole day uh, to talk about what, it, what secularization and secularism means. But I think in the, uh, when it comes to religious groups and their claims, it's um, the European experience or what Europe made out of its experience may be unique in, 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 in comparison to other cultural regions. And you cannot overemphasize the, uh, the Treaty of uh, Westphalia, the peace treaty after the Thirty Years' War which has been given under the presumption uh, in Latin, et si Deus non deretur, as if God wouldn't exist. And it's been like a, a um, it doesn't mean that all the opponents turned atheists, but it, they realized that their claims, whether or not Jesus is present in the Eucharist or not, can be decided on the battlefield. So it has become very, I mean, and also like within the medieval or late medieval framework, also the secular ruler had some upholding over the belief of, it, of the flock. So, and they were like confined in these ideas. And I think the, the treaty, the peace treaty of uh, uh, Westphalia um, put an end to this. And, and to religious war and just saying it doesn't, it doesn't mean we have no religion whatsoever, but we cannot solve eternal questions within a, a, a polity framework. And I think that's something that in, uh, that you, with all the differences about secularism and secularization, uh, this is very unique to the European uh, experience. Do we have other questions? So, I think now it's working. Okay, so uh, Sergio, you mentioned something that I, I was interested in when you were saying that um, according to all religions, there is such thing as a soul. And this would mm, perhaps create a sort of common, common ground where religious, relig religions could um, uh, perhaps find a, a a dialogue and perhaps some common normative framework, perhaps. I wonder whether um, also ha having uh, Alex here, who is an expert on comparative religions as well, um, is there such a notion that this soul is equivalent for all individuals? Or is, is, is there a notion that only some individuals who, who believe have a soul or lose their soul? Or is there also a notion of a sort of benevolent deity, a benevolent God, and if, if such is the case, would this God be tolerant? If, if, if there are some premises like that, and they can become universal premises that can be shared by religions, maybe we have a ground for religious tolerance, but I'm not sure that's the case. So having a relig religious comparison, just to clarify my points, because I, I used the word soul, but it's, it was a, a, 
it wasn't that all the religions, they have these words that they, con they consider that is transcendence. And, and there is an identity with, which goes beyond our, our body. There are different names for that. It's the same with God. If I say every, all the religions they believe in God, that's not to totally precise, but they believe that there is something else as the, that this physical world. So I say that that's the common grounds, and, and when I say that, I'm looking at the texts of religions. Because also, when I speak about religion, I don't, I don't speak about any kind of interpretations about religion, but about these uh, texts that, that are the, the heart of every, every religion. Just to clarify what. It's a it's very interesting question, Jorge. And it's like, um, well, so if we have a soul, it's very much questionable. And if we have a soul, if the soul is immortal, it's even more questionable. So I, I, but what I think is still valid is that the notion of the soul, so what we describe as soulish in a way, it's very much valid. But today we know it does not derive from an organ within ourselves, but it's just, it, it, it describes sort of a complexity of our human existence. And I th I'd say, this is, again, a very secular framework, which you may find, like, many religions can subscribe to this in this overlapping consensus sort of idea. But I think if you, if you would set on a, if you would um, have a premise for mutual understanding of a communication between religion and identity, which rests upon a thing that we cannot see and do not know that it exists, it is, it's just like replicating uh, problems from the past. And also, it's, on, on the other hand, it's like, I think what we do today is when we speak about human rights, they may have an overlap to what we would, cons what our ancestors would have considered like the soulish essence of, of a being, like the indestructible part of your human nature. And um, I think there's, a, but a, what I think is very important in this, when you look into religions and you look into the text of the mystics, and you would blind out the name of any given mystic, male, female, Muslim, Jewish, Christian, you wouldn't know uh, what religion this person has, because they all, I mean, from the texts I know, and I'm not an expert on that specifically, but a Christian mystic or a Sufi in Islam, they would all describe the, en the divine entity or the divinity as something that you cannot possess and not in the end, compulsively, no. So I think uh, if, you, if you look into a non-politicized religion, you will always find a lot of um, openness and amb ambiguity towards um, dogma, like saying, uh, I know exactly what it is, and if you don't believe it, so this is in, 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 a, in, a, in a mystical context where we're, let's say, eremits and monks and, and nuns speak, uh, you do not find this divisiveness that you may find within a political religious framework. Uh, another thing I wanted to give, like concrete example, for instance, in Egypt, in Egypt, in Iran, and in Bahrain, there is a movement of it's called the coexistence movement, and th there are people from different religions that they are legitimizing this point by from their religion. So it's quite strong because we use the secular narrative, but they use the religious narrative to, let, to, to justify this, this issue. So there are practical experiences of how this notion is a proposing an alternative framework of coexistence, using religious logics. Thank you. I believe we have a question in the audience. Bueno, mi intervención va a ser en, en, en español porque me encuentro más cómoda. Eh, bueno, ante todo... Ah, ah, que me lo acerque más. Eh, bueno, ante todo, felicitar a, a los ponentes por sus intervenciones tan sugerentes. Eh, bueno, a mí me ha interesado mucho eh, el... Buscar, o sea, que me gustaría que desarrollaran esta idea, sobre todo el profesor Alexander Ger, eh, Gerlach, eh, de la búsqueda de un marco ¿no? en el que eh, la gente se sienta que pertenece a ese lugar. 
Eh, uno de los problemas que me parecen a mí eh, más importantes en este momento y más difícil es un reto para las sociedades complejas eh, que tenemos es el de buscar ese marco común, porque ese marco común de valores consensuados por no solo un pluralismo religioso que hace más complejas cada vez a las sociedades, sino también porque eh, el desarrollo de la libertad en la igualdad, valores que la Constitución, las constituciones modernas occidentales reconocen, está dando lugar también al, digamos, a que determinados comportamientos que están amparados por el ejercicio de derechos fundamentales sean condenados eh, por confesiones religiosas, la Iglesia Católica, entre otras. Con lo cual, yo creo que la complejidad no solamente se focaliza en el pluralismo religioso, sino también hay que comprender en esa complejidad a los no creyentes, es decir, aquellas personas cuyos comportamientos pueden ser sancionados por las religiones, cualquiera, no importa, coinciden muchas veces en la condena de determinados comportamientos, todas ellas, y eh, bueno, pues esto yo creo que suma conflicto a estas sociedades. Por lo tanto, vuelvo otra vez a la idea originaria y a la pregunta con la que he empezado mi intervención, de la importancia de buscar un marco común, es decir, un marco de valores consensuados, por creyentes y no creyentes, porque a veces esta, digamos, eh, explosión de, de la preocupación de, de la, del pluralismo religioso y de abordar eh, todos los retos que nos plantea nos hace olvidar casi siempre a los no creyentes. La ocupación del espacio por parte solo de los creyentes yo creo que crea un problema también, porque al final parece como que eh, todo debe ser ocupado por los que creen y los que no creen desaparecen y quedan, bueno, afortunadamente protegidos por la Constitución, pero, eh, digamos, en un lugar eh, muy secundario que a mí no me gustaría que se olvidara. Eh, y, en, y, y entonces, en ese sentido, creo que la búsqueda de esos valores comunes es muy importante no olvidarles. Eh, la pregunta que le hago al... A, al doctor Gerlich es, eh, ¿cree que cuál sería en su opinión ese modelo, o sea, ese marco, ese marco común, cómo se construiría? ¿Cree que el modelo de interculturalidad que propuso el Consejo de Europa en el libro mmm, del diálogo intercultural, el libro blanco del diálogo intercultural en 2008, podría ser un modelo oportuno? para resolver estos problemas, es decir, recoge aquellos valores que, sobre los que podríamos empezar a construir ese marco común en el, con el que todos nos sintiéramos identificados, creyentes, no creyentes, con, pertenecientes a una cultura o a otra. Se me ocurren valores como la solidaridad, eh, tan comunes a todos. ¿no? Eh, en relación con su intervención, eh, lo que me gustaría, está enlazado con este tema, con esta pregunta que acabo de hacer, es eh, Usted, en cambio, ha puesto el énfasis sobre todo en la importancia de las confesiones para encontrar las identidades. Eh, en relación con mi intervención previa, ¿no le parece que ese focalizar el lugar donde uno se identifica no daría lugar a una sociedad fragmentada? Es decir, ¿no sería más interesante buscar la, los, los signos de pertenencia en algo que estuviera por encima de las religiones. Nada más. Muchas gracias. That's a very interesting and also very valid question. The, there is something that they call a, um, a constitutional. They, there is something they call a, a constitutional patriotism. So meaning that the constitutional framework uh, implies a. What is the framework for people of all walks of life and of all faith? Uh, basically, the United States is the beacon of, of this sort of patriotism. And uh, one can argue, especially the Germans could argue that after the Second World War, where uh, the country was so, with the Marshall Plan and all that came along with it, has learned over the last 70 years to also embrace constitutionalism as the framework in which we operate our societies. So I think this is also something that's, that, that should be highly inclusive to uh, people of all faith. 
However, I warn, it does not solve all the questions we, we have in mind, because we may be living in a global village and we may have a constitution, but in our village, do the bells ring or does the muezzin sing? Is that, you know, it's just like the, um, the frameworks, the constitutional frameworks, as far as I can understand them as a non-lawmaker, tend to one extent or the other be very uh, tolerant or open towards religion. So one of, the, one of the, the marks is the freedom of or freedom from whatever religion, but it acknowledges that for uh, human identity, uh, the religious um, uh, connotation, the religious upbringing, and also the religious practice is um, essential in a certain way. So even the constitutional framework um, will not solve all the practical questions that we may have within societies. And I think Europe has a, has it, is, has, has it not easy to embrace um, cultural, let's say, uh, variety or multitude. It's the, the, the debate about what Muslims eat or what the Jews eat and uh, how, how do they slaughter their, their, how do they create their, their, their beef and how, you know, what is the holidays, do they have other holidays than we do? So there is a learning uh, to be done on both sides that within the constitutional framework, you may, uh, you may set the rules, but on an everyday basis, there is still like a lot of, work to be done. Well, my, no sé hablar en castellano en inglés. In English, okay, I speak in English for... Uh, so, the point I have is that if we want to understand, well, phenomenon related to religion as fundamentalism on terrorism, you will need to understand the logics of religion. That, that was my point, not that the solution comes from religion. But if we want to understand this phenomena, we need also to understand the logics of, of religion. That, that was my point. But uh, responding to your direct question, I agree. Uh, there is, there is uh, I would say that the, the human right uh, it's the human right discourse is, the, is a framework for everyone, but not the liberal interpretations of human rights as civil and political rights over the others. The whole system of human rights, individual, political rights, social, economic, collective rights, all the, the different rights which are indivisible in the discourse. That's the framework. Then also there are other people like Amartya Sen. No? Amartya Sen, this author, uh, when he speaks about identities, he has a conception which is quite, uh, I think, uh, interesting. The, the fact that we are humans, that makes like the basic of our identity, and then there are circles of identities, secondary identities. The problem with Amartya Sen, from my perspective, is that he doesn't like collective identities. His conception is that collective identity is always oppressive. That's his point. But the, the, the human rights frameworks, I think it's good for everyone. But then, what I also would say that then the, the, legitima, the justifications for human rights could be secular or could be religious. It doesn't matter. Actually, there is one of the ideas that it's mentioned uh, about this, the secular society is that the justification discourses for the intersubjective agreements of society could be diverse. And I think that's, that's fine. If the religious groups, they think that, that human rights are fundamental because God has mentioned that, it's fine. For others, they say that's the, the, the fundamental agreement for everyone because we are human beings equal in dignity. And so, fantastic as well. No? But there is this framework which I, I think that could be uh, proposed. The problem is that the way some countries are interpreting human rights it's like, okay, United States speaking about human rights, but they're speaking about civil rights, so we don't like human rights. But I think most of people agree on that, but, but there is this um, indivisibility of human rights which, which should be proposed. Thank you very much. Um, our time for the first presentation is over. Unfortunately, we can talk about this um, very interesting topic, I'm sure, um, for a long time to come, and we will. Um, I'd like again to thank um, Dr. Gorak and Dr. Garcia and all of you for your questions and your participation and your interest in this panel discussion. We're going to take a break now, a short break, until 11 o'clock, and then we will resume with another panel discussion. Thank you.